Brocona. No. Okay.
This afternoon we're going to be looking at a message that I thought, thought would be a, apropos for the times that we're living in and it's going to basically involve a lot of the things that you should already know. Stressed out? No one's stressed out here, right? Because it's a choice. It's your choice to be stressed out or not. Problems are inevitable. Everyone will get hit with problems. But stress is optional. And hopefully by the time we're done with the message, you'll understand what I mean. But before we look into the word of God, a few verses. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That should be the challenge for every church around the world. To get the gospel out, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that by simply believing in him, they can have everlasting life. The COVID has claimed a lot of lives. The Delta variant, now the Lambda all of these variants that are coming out are claiming lives at a rapid rate. Some of you are wearing masks and recognizing the reality of that truth. So don't forget that we have the vaccine for death. And that is everlasting life through Christ. People are going to die. It's a part of life. That's going to happen to you and to me. Now, the people who should be afraid are those who do not know where they're going. The scripture talks about two places, heaven and the lake of fire or hell. So we are going to heaven. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're listening online, or if you're here for the first or second time or regularly, then you know that by simply believing in Jesus, that's all it takes. Because he went on the cross and paid the sin debt. He paid for your dinner plus more. That's why it's called the sin debt. On the cross, he paid for the sin debt of the world. There's nothing you need to add to it to, to um, receive salvation. It's not a goal to be achieved. It's a gift to be received. You just believe in Jesus Christ. And that's why I repeatedly share these verses because some will come uh, and say after church or when I'm conversing with someone, they'll say, you mean to tell me all I have to do is believe in Jesus? That's it? What about the Muslims? They believe in Jesus. Are they saved? 
And I'm quick to point out that if you look at what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever what? Believes in him will not perish, but have what? Now, my, the way I phrase the question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ can give you the tail end of the verse? Do you believe that Jesus alone can give you everlasting life? I don't just say, oh, you just believe in Jesus. I, when I talk to Samantha, come up here. If I'm talking to Samantha for the first time and I, I want to share the gospel to her, Samantha, we've been friends now for at least 10 years, you know, and I have, I, I've never shared what I'm about to share, and it's failure on my part because I'm embarrassed that you would laugh at me and think of me as weird. But you know what? With all these people dying all around the world and you wearing a mask, it's obvious that you're concerned about the pandemic, true? Did you know that you can know for sure that if you die, you can go to heaven? Would you like to know how? Jesus said when he was talking to one of the teachers of Israel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know a little about Jesus? Do you know he went on the cross? Did you go to church before? So you know some of this stuff. Well, all of that is what he did to secure salvation on the cross. Do you believe that he died, was buried, and rose on the third day? So he has supreme power over death. He's also la raised a person by the name of Lazarus from the dead. He's also given sight to the blind. In John chapter 9, there was a blind man born like that. And his disciples said, who sinned, the parents or him? And Jesus said, no one. It's not about sin for this guy. It's about the glory of God. But... Samantha, this is very critical. He promises everlasting life. The, the person who conquered death, the person who raised himself from the dead, the person who raised Lazarus from the dead, the, per, the per, same person who was able to spit on the ground and put mud in this guy's eyes so that he can see. Obviously, he's not just a normal person, right? Right. Because the Bible teaches that he's God the Son, second person of the Trinity. And I can explain more of that later on, but I have to go. I'm in a hurry. So I just want, wanted you to know that if you would just believe in him for everlasting life, he promises to give it to you. Do you want to know? Would you like to have the assurance that you would one day go to heaven? Would you believe in Jesus now for everlasting life? Guess what? You've got it. Congratulations. You're now a part of the family of God. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. That's all it takes. It doesn't... I'm not here to tell her, you know what, until you change the way that you look, change your hairstyle, change your, change your behavior, God is not going to accept you. God accepts all people because all people are made in his image. Let's not forget that. But that doesn't mean that he agrees with their behavior or their lifestyle. That's where the power of God comes in. That's where the local churches come in and say, you need Christ. I know your struggles. I know the challenges you are facing. I know that you're stressed out. But there is a real power that this world does not even know about. And that power is rooted in a relationship to God the Father through the power of Jesus Christ under the influence of God the Holy Spirit. All triune, the three in one, the Godhead is available to you. And so when Samantha believed in Christ, I didn't ask her to pray to ask Jesus into her heart. Did you notice that? I'm not going to say that that's a sin, but the scripture repeatedly says, believe, believe, believe. If you listen to the verses I I share before uh, we prayed, it was believe, believe, believe. That's it. I've studied this for over 30 years now, so I have confidence that the only issue between a person who is headed for the lake of hell, fire or heaven bound is simply to believe in Christ. That's it. But Pastor Freddie, then anybody can just believe and then live like the devil. 
I'm not endorsing that. I'm saying, first of all, let's get the truth out. Let's look at the scriptures together and see what it says. The issue is believing in him. In fact, when was the last time you asked someone to believe in Jesus? More than likely, they, they kind of said, no, it's not my thing. I'm not into church. I'm not into, because if I go to church that thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that, thou shall not do this. I'm not into that. So it's not easy to believe in Jesus. But the simplicity is not stressed enough, I believe. It's only believing in Christ. Once Samantha is in the family of God, Samantha, come up here again. Now that she is a believer in God, I'm going to stay with her. I'll connect her with someone at church who is a female and say, can you ground her in the word of God now? She needs to be discipled so that she knows what to do to please God. But salvation is birth, inward change that takes place in her heart. You can't see it on the outside. Can you tell that I'm born again by looking at me? You can't tell that she is either because it's not something we can see on the external. Our behavior might, I can carry a, a bottle of vodka and then you might question me and say, what is he doing? Why is he getting drunk? That's external behavior. Maybe I'm lacking the power to allow me to live for God. And I have been discipled. I don't know how to access this power. So I'm just living on my own strength. Oh, gosh, it's so hard to be a Christian. I'm only human. Thank you, Samantha. So my point is, because we're living at, in these crazy times, we have to be crystal clear on what we're going to promote and advance. Because life is like that. My uncle passed away last Sunday, if you saw the email. That was no joke. I made it in the nick of time to share the gospel with him. At the very last second, his last breath, in fact, he sighed. And he opened his eyes when he recognized my voice. Right after church, I booked over there. I did not wait. I went in and I got met with resistance, one after another. We don't have a comfort care here. I'm sorry, we don't have a gen here. I had all these roadblocks. I said, Lord, I came all the way here. I had one of the nurses here in the hospital, in the church, clear it and talk to someone she knew and said, just tell them Jen from Comfort Care um, will allow you to see him. And I said, can I at least pray for him over the phone? I came all the way to Mission Hospital. <clears throat> so she said, the lady at the front desk said, well, if you're not vaccinated, if you don't have a negative, um, anything showing that you're negative, we're sorry, we can't. I mean, just the phone, please. And she said, well, go over there and see security. So I go to security and I talk to security. And I said, you know, there's a lady by the name of Jen from Comfort Care who said she cleared me that I can go in and just to bring her name up and just tell whoever's at the front desk because I'm a minister. You're a minister? Let me ask my supervisor. Uh, there's a pastor here. There's a minister here up in front. He's here to see room 147. Yes, Jen cleared him from comfort care. The supervisor said, we don't have a comfort care. You mean spiritual care? So I said, no, specifically comfort care. There was no spiritual care and no comfort care and no Jen. Every reason not to go in was closed. And then the security guard just said, well, you know, do your thing. You're here to just pray, right? Just tell them I sent you. If they have a problem, just have them call me. Go to the nurse. He gave me a map. He, he drew a map and showed me how to get to the room, the charge nurse. And if I had any problems to have the charge nurse call him who let me in. So I followed the map, went to the, char the nurse's station, went there. <clears throat> And uh, went to room 147, had my PPE gown, double masked, um, gloves, went into the room, and it was a negative, negative pressure inside the room, so I knew it was serious. And went in there, and he was laying in the bed, and I was saying, Uncle, I was from a distance. 
because I have a family and I, I know I, I have a church family as well. And so I, I'm very careful and I kept, a dis, kept distant and I talked to him like this from a distance. And then I went a little closer and I raised my voice and I think I startled him. Uncle! He opened his eyes and I said, Uncle, you're in critical condition. I said, this is Freddy. I, I was talking firmly and loudly and I said, Uncle, you're in bad shape. I said, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I'm going to pray for you. But before I pray for you, I want to share something with you. Uncle, you need Jesus Christ because if this turns for the worse, you need him, please. And then I shared John 3, 16, like I did to Samantha. Uncle, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. He opened his eyes, struggled like, like he was trying to talk to me with his eyes. And I think he was like saying, okay, like he's in agreement. And then he sighed. And then I left. And I, I drove home and I said, Lord, um, I did what I could. And I said, uh, please intervene and let him live a little longer so I can nurture him and disciple him. And then that afternoon he passed. So talk about the nick of time. So please don't wait to the last second. I did not know I was going to go there and talk to him. But please make it a point. Wherever you go, the people that you know, they're recipients of the gospel message. You don't know when the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, on the bus, at work, in your school, if they're gonna, when they're going to pass. There's a reason why God allowed you to have a friendship with them. And don't ever forget that. I just shared my story, or the story of my uncle, so that you can see that time is really short and things can happen in, in a moment's notice. So please don't wait. So stressed out, it's your choice. Look at what the Bible has to say with regards to our thinking. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. This is why we do not tell kids, like um, DJ and um, Jasmine, don't tell Grace that she's dummy, she's dumb, you're, you're, you're a loser. Don't talk to your daughter. I know you don't. I know you don't. But parents, we don't talk to our kids like that. What tends to happen is they believe it. So the scripture is clear. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you bombard a person with the same thoughts over and over and over, you're a loser, you're a loser, you're a winner, you can do anything, you can rise to the top, they will believe it. So if you repeatedly inculcate this in your soul and in your mind, the scripture says, that's what you'll be. And this is why you also... When you couple this with Philippians 4, we know Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for what? Nothing. But with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And when you get to 8 and 9 of that, after 6 and 7, he doesn't leave us hanging. He says, Get your thoughts on track. I want you to, whatever is true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, focus on those things. Stop thinking about all the crud out there. No wonder why you're depressed and discouraged. How many of you have canceled your Facebook accounts and your social media because it's discouraging? That's what Philippians 4 is all about. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, good report. You go to Instagram or Facebook, all they're doing is showing what they ate. And then it just goes on and on and on and on. Whatever is a, a virtue, anything praiseworthy, what does it say? Meditate, focus on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, Paul speaking. These do 
and the God of peace will be with you. So he says, the things that you've learned in church, if the pastor is doing his due justice, his due diligence, and he's honoring God by following faithfully what the word of God teaches, then the things you've learned and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And any of you need peace? He's going to be with you. How many people today need peace? Survey the landscape of our country alone. People are so discouraged and stressed out. They take medicine just to function, just to go to work. Then to wake up, they take more medicine. No joke. For us, we have a vertical relationship with God. And when we understand that we can trust him with our entire life, you won't have to stress. Because he's the one who said don't stress. Be anxious for nothing. As a man thinks, so is he. So if you're worried about this, that, and the other, you're going to be worried. Your face will show it. Your body will show it. You'll break out in rashes, hives, all kinds of issues, health issues. Now, if you happen to have that now, don't think that I'm talking about you. I'm just saying that that could be the byproduct. I've heard this happen to numerous people. Because they stress out, they break out in all kinds of things. That doesn't have to be the case for you. Why? You belong to God. Do you not? You belong to someone who's sovereign and supreme and has all power to rain hell on your enemies if he so desires. He can protect you. He, he has legions of angels that he can surround you with if need be. So where we tend to blunder is when we go to the edge of the cliff and say, well, oh, no, I don't want, I, it's too much for me. I can't do this anymore. It's too hard. I, I, yeah, I, I trust you, but, uh, and you stop right at the very end. And then you, what do you do? So here you are, you're saying, I love you, Lord. I'm not going to worry about this problem anymore. And then at the last second, you, you worry. The moment you worry, you nullify the promise from Philippians 4, where he promises to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Pastor Freddie, you know what? I've been praying for two years now, and God hasn't given me any kind of peace. Why am I still in this dilemma? And then when, you, when I look closely at, at how they, when they say that they've been praying, I said, well, what do you mean you've been praying? Well, you know, I go, before I sleep, before I start my day, I said, Lord, you know, this problem that I'm having with this person, I just can't seem to, to deal with it, shake it off. And then, so then what happens? Well, I go to work, I, I see the person, and then I just, I lose it. I, I get all angry, I get all upset. Well, that's the problem. You start worrying right when you face the problem. When God himself said, be anxious for nothing. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, you have to know him so well that when you step into the room with that same person, you can say, you know what? Lord, under normal circumstances, the last several months, you know I fall apart and I just start to, I can't think straight and I start sweating. I don't know, I have panic attacks, but I'm going to give this to you. This is your problem, not mine. You've, you've shown me in the, in the scriptures that you fight the battle stand still and see the salvation of the lord i'm tired of i'm tired of running i can't do this anymore i'm getting sick i'm weak this has been an ongoing problem for me so effective today i'm casting my cares upon you that word cast has the idea of wrestling the problem onto god throwing it to him cast your cares upon him but when you cast it and say lord Take care of the problem. But then you're like freaking out. You've just nullified Philippians 4. Why? You've broke the command. Be anxious for what? Nothing. So this is why we don't 
get to witness a lot of answered prayer because at the last second, we pull the problem back. We say, oh, I, I pray about it, but then, Lord, take the problem, but then you, you wind up taking it back. So Philippians 4 doesn't apply to you. You short-circuit the promise. So keep in mind, I hope you're seeing the dilemma here. You have this problem, and so you're taking it up in prayer. I'm not saying you're not praying about it. Everyone prays, even the demons. Even the demons believe and shudder. The problem I see with most Christians today is they're stressing out when God says, be anxious for nothing. And the remedy for that is in the same verse. Be anxious for nothing but in, with, but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Then the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. You'll have mental health. You don't, won't go into depression. Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But if you are claiming that promise and then you stress out, oh my gosh, here she comes, here he comes, and you say, oh God, I hate this. You just, you violated the promise. You're, you're worrying again. It's better that you start the day off with confession. Lord, I'm going to work and I need supreme power. So I'm going to see this person again and this person was the one who who spread a rumor in the office, and I'm just, I'm hating this person. You said, love your enemies, and I want this person to go to hell, to be honest. But I'm going to confess my thoughts from the last, last week and the weeks prior, because I just want this guy dead. I wish this guy would die of COVID. I've heard of people making these kind of things. I, I hope they catch COVID and die. I hate this person. These are Christians. So it can happen when you're stressed out. And don't think that we shouldn't monitor our stress levels. What happened with Cain and Abel? Cain was jealous. That's just a cousin of stress. Because his offering was received and God was pleased with his brother's offering, but not his. And so what did he do to his brother? Killed his own brother. It can happen to any of us. Stress is a precursor to doing crazy things, including murder. So moving on. Next slide. Every believer has two vying powers, and I've covered this the last couple weeks because it all ties in with what we're learning, and I want you to walk away with stability. So you've got a sin nature and a, the Holy Spirit in you. And I'll show you a modified diagram. I finally updated the diagram. Matthew 26, 41 tells us, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's why we've got these two opposing forces inside us. The sin nature, our human spirit, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll show you the next slide. in the next slide. To be able to overcome sin, the believer needs a power greater than the power coming from the sin nature. This power will enable the believer to obey the word and not panic, not worry. When the scripture says, don't worry for anything. Remember in Galatians 5.16, it says the following, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we walk in the spirit, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We are not promised freedom from the desires of the sin nature, but from the victory of the sin nature or the flesh itself. Here's the new and improved slide in just a moment. Remember 1 John 3, 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And I remember I explained this uh, two weeks ago, that it says, whoever has been born of God does not sin. 
How many of you sin? I do. We all do. It's not saying we won't sin, but the seed in us. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. His seed remains in him, and he, the seed, cannot sin because he has been born of God. So you get into verses like this, and someone will say, you're not supposed to sin anymore. I see you with a, um, a whiskey bottle or something, or you're smoking. And so when you sin, it's not coming from the human spirit or the new nature. But notice, let me show it here. It's a little easier to explain here. You'll recall that I would pointed out that we have the old sin nature and the new nature. This has been born from God. When a person believes in Christ, you get this circle here. You can't see it now. It's, it's faded with the white on this background here. The old man, the sin nature, has a tendency to sin. When you sin, it's because of this dark circle in you. When you do good things for God, it's coming from here. The new man, the new you, the new nature or the human spirit that was given to you upon faith in Jesus. This side never sins. Just imagine, an, can you kind of see a circle there? That circle, I'm sorry it's not showing up on the screen too well, but there's supposed to be a circle here. It's a white circle as well, but it's being washed out by the white in the background here. But there's a circle here. This is the new you. This is where you receive power. This is where you do good things for God. When you sin, it never comes from here because this part never ever sins. Only your old nature, the old man, has the tendency to sin. The sin originates from here. Never, this side here never sins. This circle here, the new you never ever sins. So when you do good things for God, it's coming from here. When you do bad things and you have uh, mental, overt, or verbal sins, it originates here. Because this side, 1 John 3, 9 says, could never sin because it's been born of God, the seed of God that lives in you, that divine nature side that you have been given at the moment of faith, never ever sins. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is is weak this side is willing but this side is not so there's a constant tension going back and forth plus pa do you have your bible pa do you have your bible can you read first corinthians six nineteen? as a reminder just to So keep in mind, you have the new man inside at the moment of faith. So when we share Jesus Christ, we're trying to get people, unbelievers, to believe in Christ so that they can receive a new nature, a new human spirit, and then this side will never sin. You have the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The old man, the sin nature, this is where you sin. This is where you struggle. So if you're cussing all the time, you're stealing all the time, you're getting drunk. And, oh, you got it? Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. You are not your own. Do you not know that your body is the temple of who? The Holy Spirit. So here's the old man. Here's the new man. Plus you have the Holy Spirit in you. Multiple entities warring on the inside. The Holy Spirit is trying to communicate the word of God to your human spirit that's found here. So when the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 1.18 that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us it is the power of God. So the more that we get into the word of God, the message that's found in the word of God, there's power in there. Now, why do we need power? To say no at the appropriate times, no to sin, yes to God. 
But when you're sitting there struggling, saying, you know, but it's so hard, I'm, I try and I'm just tired. Well, part of it could be the tension and the, the warring going on in here. This is very taxing. Did you know that this is stressful? This is hard on the body? Because think about it. You're sitting there saying, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have, you fill in the blanks. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh my God, why did, I'm so, I'm so stupid. Have you ever said things like that? You know how, how tiring that is? You know how hard that is on the body? That's another form of stress. You're sitting here saying, I'm so dumb. Why did I even say that? Oh God. Well, it's in nature. What are you doing to counter this? This is intact. This is okay. This wants to obey. This is willing. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, the old man, is weak. So this tug of war is going on. Now, when we have God, the Holy Spirit, this is our charger. This is what I've been sharing in our Bible study. Most of you have something called a cell phone like this, right? <clears throat> An iPhone or an Android, if you have an Android, we still pray for you. you know, we, we'll pray that one day you'll be a Christian. Just kidding. But, you know, these things, they can only last for so many hours, and then you need to charge it up because they consume battery, especially if you're on, on the phone a lot. Well, likewise, <clears throat> our power source is right here, God the Holy Spirit. He's ready to flex and work in you and through you. But if you're not, in, if you've grieved him, there's a disconnect between these two. The scripture says, do not grieve nor quench the spirit of God. And just like Nestor, Tess, can you come up? I'll use you guys because you're a good looking couple. I, I think I used you guys before, right? So let's just say Nestor's beautiful wife and him are talking and then he says something to hurt her and she's grieved. Now he's, he's interested in going out for dinner. What would you say? No. Okay. No. Why? Because. She's hurt. Right? If you hurt her feelings, she's not going to want to do anything. You're going to be in the doghouse, they would say. Right? You sleep on the couch. Right? And she's like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, thank you. We understand in terms of human relationships that if you grieve one or the other, you don't expect them to get along or to hang out and have dinner, right? Do we understand that? That's common sense, right? <clears throat> if I upset my wife, she's not going to talk to me, not going to cook, nothing. Everything is off. Power is switches off. So I don't want to upset her. She doesn't want to upset me either. We're, we're just really in sync. We get along quite well. So I'm blessed to have her as a spouse. My point is, is that remember this, okay? The new you depends on God, the Holy Spirit. You hurt him, you grieve him, you quench him, their power is shut. The verses I've shown before, walk by means of the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You grieve him, you have no power. You're disconnected from the power. So which is why we confess our sins regularly, habitually, because we have a tendency to forget sometimes. And some of the sins that we commit are all mental. How many of you have said within the last 20 minutes, when is Pastor Freddie done? <laughs> oh my gosh. He keeps gabbing. What time is it? Is it time, isn't it time to go home yet? Things like that. It's fleeting right here, mentally. Someone cuts you off. What do you say? Oh, have a good day. Is that what you say? Anything can catch us by surprise at a moment, just like that. So, which is why we prioritize confession. Because remember, if Nestor grieved 
test, even if it's just a real quick, oh, you know what, you, you, how come you look so heavy today? That's it. Ne uh, Nestor's in the doghouse for a while. You know, don't wear that. You look, you, you look different. He's going to get it. You watch. When you grieve someone's spirit, there's nothing that's going to happen anymore from that point on. Unless what? It's rectified. Honey, I'm sorry. I was so stupid. Please forgive me. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, boom, he's no longer grieved, he's no longer quenched. Why is that important? Because that's where your power comes from. That's where the peace of God that surpasses all understanding comes from. Because if you panicked and you didn't even realize that that was a sin, Lord, there's that person again. I hate that person. And instead of giving it to God, you, you take it back. Lord, I'm not going to stress out over this. I'm tired of it. Uh, you know what? But there's that loser again. Oh, my God, I hate him. You just, you violated Philippians 4. How many times have you violated Philippians 4 not even knowing it? And when you do, you grieve. Grieve who? God, the Holy Spirit, who is the temple. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is the new sanctuary. This is not the sanctuary. Your body is the sanctuary. Your body is the temple of God. The true temple of God is now here in this dispensation, in this church age. So how many people are aware of this? Probably not very many. Most will say, well, I'm just human. You know, I just, I'll try harder next week. New Year's is coming around. I'll make a New Year's resolution. I promise, Lord, I'm not going to skip church. I'm not going to get drunk anymore. I'm just going to, I'm going to read my Bible every day. And then guess what happens? New Year comes. Same thing. So here's the problem, guys. We have a new nature in us. We have an old nature that remains in us until we die. And we have God, the Holy Spirit, who is inside us. So every time we sin here, it grieves him. And so this side is willing to obey, but this isn't. But when this side sins, remember sin originates from here, never from here, because this is a born again you. Never ever sins, as per 1 John 3, 9. So if this never sins, but we sin, we confess it. When that takes place, now the new nature is able to interact with God, the Holy Spirit, thus giving you power. And you'll now be able to understand the peace that surpasses all understanding because you're not at odds with God anymore. So moving on. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Um, pa, can you read one more verse? 1 Corinthians 2.14. <laughs> yes, 1 Corinthians So the man without the spirit does not receive the things of the spirit of God. Does that sound like the people we talk to? When you share the gospel, they don't receive it. They don't accept it. It's foreign to them. They don't welcome it. So don't be surprised. The Bible already tells us this. So we bombard it with a lot of prayer and make the difference with our lives. Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, nudging them with our behavior. So keep this in mind. The unbelieving world doesn't have the spirit of God, so they won't receive you. Invite them to church. Nah, it's not for me. Uh, you want to believe in Jesus? Nah, I'm not religious. I've tried church. It doesn't work for me. 
So the natural man won't receive the things of the Spirit. Anything that you share, oh, you know what, I, I'm worried about you. I know uh, your, your family member contracted COVID, and I'm just wondering about you, and I'm praying for you. Please don't pray for me. I'm not into that stuff. Just keep it to yourself. I appreciate the gesture, but I'm not, I don't care for prayer. Thank you anyways. 1 Corinthians 2.14. They don't welcome it at all. We're living under the sway of the God of this age, which is Satan himself. He's alive and powerful. He's active. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this age has placed a veil over the eyes of people, lest they believe. So the only ones that will have an impact are people like you and me, who believe in Jesus Christ for his everlasting life, who believe that people need Christ, and we understand that God himself said his desire is that none should perish. And because it's his desire, should that not be our desire as well? Now, that doesn't mean quit your job, quit school, quit working, quit this and that. Be yourself. Be the evangelist among your periphery and make an impact. Because everyone is warring with this right now and they don't know it. They laugh at you because of this. And 1 Corinthians 2.14, they're oblivious to the eternal consequences of what happens when a person is without Christ. So we need to be proactive. What determines which power one is accessing? Mindset, I showed you this as well. An inclination or a habit. A proper mindset will determine whether you will experience death or life and what's the second word? Peace. So it's a mindset based on Romans 8. Look closely. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Therefore, ref the word therefore refers back to chapter 7, 24 to 25, where Paul declared that through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we can be delivered from the daily onslaught of the sin nature. So we're, there's a tension, a war going on on the inside but we have been freed. There's no more slavery, no condemnation. That word is katakrima. It introduces a con the word therefore introduces a conclusion based on everything that Paul wrote from chapter 3 on. A believer must believe that he has a permanent acceptance with God before that one will grow much in grace and in godliness. So there is therefore no condemnation to those who are, there's that word preposition in again, in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the Spirit. We may lose our fellowship with God, but we are no longer slaves to sin. This word no condemnation has the idea of um, slavery to sin. It is the freedom from the enslaving power of sin in the life of the believer. How is this possible? Because the believer is in Christ. As such, the believer is free from the enslaving power to sin. You don't have to be controlled by the sin nature anymore, in other words. You have God's power who makes it available to say yes and no at the appropriate times. Victory has been provided to you. You have no condemnation anymore. Now, some would take this to mean no more, no, I'm not going to hell anymore. There's therefore no condemnation, katakrima. 
Greek word for no condemnation, and that certainly is the case that there is no eternal consequences, there's no eternal separation. But in context, it's referring to the enslaving power of sin. So instead of thinking there's therefore no hell to those who are in Christ Jesus, contextually, this is referring to no more slavery to sin, because this word katakrima refers to slavery to sin, which is what I've been showing you in those diagrams, the warring going on with the circles inside. You have that white circle, the new you, and the dark gray circle, the old man, the new man, and that tension going on. You don't have to succumb to the sin nature anymore because there is no condemnation to those in Christ. Now, you might be sitting here saying, oh my gosh, what, did he, what time has he done? What did he just say? That's a mouthful, I know. But just know this. One, there is no eternal condemnation, that's for sure. But two, you don't have to worry about the enslaving power of sin anymore because of the new nature that you received at the moment of faith. Does that make sense? So you have that new circle in you. So that new circle and the orange circle in the top, which is referring to the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is not grieved nor quenched, you've got supreme power available to your temple, to your body, to say no and yes at the appropriate times. Does that mean you'll never sin? No, John reminds us, First John reminds us, if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. So we will continue to sin even though there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. A couple more things here and then we'll proceed with, uh, we have communion today. So there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh. So that's another key word there, those who walk. You can walk according to the flesh or to the, according to the spirit. The process of living or the manner with which one behaves refers to the word walk. Being in Christ is absolutely essential to victory over sin, but by itself it's not enough. The second step is how a believer walks. He must not walk in relation to the flesh, but in relation to the spirit. It's a mindset, as you'll recall. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. The law of the spirit of life refers to the power brought by the Holy Spirit that resides in the believer. The spirit of life is in, the, is in fact the spirit who has baptized believers into Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 3-4 so that now the Spirit dwells in them, 8, 9. You can see that in Romans 8, 9. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. The word likeness of sinful flesh means it refers to both sinless and a real person. He was like us, but without sin. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So notice the righteous action of the law can be fulfilled by him as he walks in relation to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, they, the things of the spirit, they set their minds on the things of the spirit. So the behavior of believers follows their mindset. A change of attitude results from welcoming God's word. That new attitude in turn results in a change of behavior when you welcome the word of God. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, Colossians 3, 2. So in here, you have two kinds of believers who walk according to the flesh and believers who walk according to the spirit. Which one are you? Are you walking according to the flesh or the spirit? 
Philippians 2, 5, 8, a couple more verses. Let this mind be in you, in which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What is this mind? What does it look like to have the mind of Christ? I just highlighted, this is, the, this is what it would look like to be Christ-like. Don't worry about your reputation. Be humble. Think of yourself as a bondservant. Uh, everyone is the same. Humbled himself, obedient. That's the mind of Christ in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Set your minds on the things above, not on the things on the earth, Colossians 3, 2. The believer's life is centered in one's mindset. The believer does not and will not become mature without his determination in his mind to become so. So if you don't make the effort to put the word of God as a high priority, then don't expect yourself to mature. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We get closer to the true force of Paul's statement with a more literal rendering. The flesh is mind set is death, but the spirit mindset is life and peace. One belongs to the sphere of and results in death. The other belongs to a contrasting sphere with contrasting results, life and peace. So it depends on what you set your mind on. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Thinking about church, thinking about Bible study, opening your Bible, spiritually minded, you will receive life and peace. But to think like the world and fleshly, death. And I'll define that again in just a moment. To be carnally minded is to be mentally inclined to the things of the flesh. It is death as far as one's present enjoyment in life. This results in emptiness depression and spiritual impoverishment. It also has the potential of physical death if carried out to full term, according to James 1, 14 to 15, which says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown, in other, see it's a uh, pregnancy terminology, um, if you don't deal with it, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, full term, brings forth death. So it can result in death in some cases, a sin unto death. And again, to be spiritually minded is life and peace, but carnally minded is death. Life and peace is the resolution of the intense warfare described in chapter 7, and as well as the inward stability and tranquility that comes from being spiritually minded. So conclusion, here's the walk away. Your walk and behavior is determined by your mindset. So if you want to stress out, it depends on what your mind is set on. If you're set on the things of carnality and of the flesh, then death, impo impoverishment, emptiness, depression, discouragement. But if your mind is set on the things that are spiritual, life and peace. Second, whatever you set your mind in will result in either death or life and peace. Just what I said moments ago. Death equals emptiness, depression, and spiritual impoverishment and potential for early death. Whereas life and peace, life, uh, it's inward stability, and tranquility. That concludes the service. So let's uh, close in a word of prayer and then we'll partake in communion. Father, as always, we are grateful when we can examine kernels of truth from your word. And Father, we've looked at a number of things as far as our mindset, which results in peace and stability or death. Help us, Father, to commit these principles to, to our souls so that we can make application, not be guilty of being hearers only, but doers of your word. 
thank you for everyone here and their presence, uh, committed for the, to the intake of God's word. And I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless them and keep them all safe from all the viruses and pandemic that's out there. We ask all of this in Christ's precious name in which we pray. Amen. Now the men will be handing out the communion and